Good morning. Thank you very much, Michaela. And uh, thanks for joining me this morning for the first in this series of workshops that we're going to do on bad drawing. Only bad drawings are allowed this morning. Um, and I, I, before we get started, I'd like to uh, thank uh, Michaela for doing the acknowledgement. And I'd like to share that acknowledgement of the traditional owners of the land and uh, extend my respects to all of the First Peoples um, around the world and those who might be joining us here today. All right, um, as I said, my name is Bill. Um, welcome to my studio. Uh, we're in one little corner of my studio. I've got my drawing board all set up over here so I can, uh, you can watch me draw. I'll be doing some talking to you like this where you can see me and I'll be doing some drawing where you'll be able to see my drawing. I'm also gonna teach you how to make a bad pen and some bad ink this morning too. Uh, Quai Gomez shared with you the um, recipe for the type of tea-based ink that we're going to be making this morning. I've got my uh, hot water kettle right over here and we're going to start that here in just a minute. Um, I am an artist. Drawing is my bag um, and in my day job I run the drawing program at the Queensland College of Art at Griffith University. Uh, I've been teaching drawing for a long time. Uh, I absolutely love to be able to connect with different people in different ways. It's wonderful to, uh, to do this. This is the first time I've done a virtual online workshop like this and I'm really excited to, uh, to go through it with you all here this morning. Um, I'm gonna we're gonna work through this whole hour together I'm hoping by the end we might have a bit of time left uh, to answer some questions through the chat but uh, for people who know me they know I can talk so we'll see if we have a bit of uh, uh, time left at the end or not okay now first things first in each one of these drawing workshops we're going to be choosing a different work of art from the uh, Queensland Art Gallery or Gallery of Modern Art collection that we're going to work from. And this morning, that work that we're going to do is a drawing by Francois Boucher, a Rococo artist from the uh, 18th century. And you all should have received a link to that drawing in the uh, in the Quagoma collection. And what I'll ask you to do is make that link active, open up that work, get that drawing so that you have it ready, because we're going to draw from that drawing as we go through it here this morning. Now, I also have to apologize. As I'm speaking right now, the, uh, the train's going by. My studio sits adjacent the train tracks. I'm going to use this microphone and keep it really close to me. As I'm drawing over here, I'll move the microphone and as I bring it back too. So, um, hopefully that train noise won't be too loud. You might hear me pitch up my voice a little bit every time the train goes by, especially if a diesel goes by, but uh, hopefully that'll be all right for y'all. Okay, now let's get into it. First things first, we're going to talk about badness today and what makes bad drawings bad and what makes good drawings good. And we're going to do a deep dive into badness. And I'm actually going to ask all y'all to make some bad drawings today. And we're going to talk about different qualities of badness. And as our exemplar, we're going to use this drawing by Boucher because Boucher is a very interesting artist whose work has cycled in and out of favor. And even in his own lifetime, he was being accused of uh, some of the major uh, philosophers and intellectuals of the day of, of being quite a bad artist. And so I wanna talk about badness and then we're gonna get right down into doing some, uh, some bad drawing. Now, what I'd like to do is start by saying the materials that you're using. Any materials that you have available will work for today. I'm going to take you through how to make ink out of tea, just ordinary black tea, and also how to make a pen that you can use. But if you have a pencil, if you have a ballpoint pen, if you have crayons, I'm even gonna do some drawing with children's crayons um, a little bit later, anything that you can put your hands on. When we talk about badness, one of the aspects of badness that oftentimes doesn't get talked about is the artist's materials. Um, I hear this from my students all the time that they can't afford good materials, you know, and what does it mean to buy good materials? Um, and so we're going to explore badness in terms of our materials too. You can certainly go out to the art supply shop and buy the fancy sheets of drawing paper like, uh, like this if you want to. You can spend you know, 20 or $30 on bottles of ink made in France or Germany um, and, uh, and have a high quality artist ink. But today we're actually going to uh, work on ordinary paper. We're gonna work with a tea based ink that you can make for a few pennies. We're gonna make pens to dip in that ink and we are going to deal with that quality of materials and, and talk about it. You know, some of the most famous drawings done in the 20th century were done by an American artist named Franz Klein, abstract expressionist artist. And he did all of those drawings on the pages of phone books. 
And they are, they're coveted drawings today, very, very important drawings, gestural black, gestural abstractions with black ink on, a, on phone book pages. Sorry, a, a phone book is a device about that big, has numbers and words in it. Anyway, um, you can look it up online, you'll find it. But those, those drawings, he did hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them. And the, uh, the, those, the quality of the paper is not what makes those really good drawings. In fact, you could, uh, you could argue that it's really bad paper, bad ink, good drawings. So first things first, um, if you're going to make some tea-based ink along with me, you have the recipe online. I've just boiled my kettle here. I have some water. What you'll need if you want to play along is just a container, any sort of a container, and four or five black tea bags. Now, uh, black tea has in it uh, a natural chemical compound called uh, tannin or tannins. Uh, all y'all here at 1041 in the morning who are enjoying a glass of wine with me um, are very familiar with tannins or anybody who's having even better a glass of bourbon um, because tannins naturally occur in plants. And when whiskey is put into barrels, the tannin from the barrels is what gives whiskey some of its flavor and its color. Um, it's a brownish color and it uh, also gives a, a taste. It gives a flavor, a kind of a bitter, starchy, uh, astringent kind of flavor. It's the same thing that gives that color and that flavor to tea. Tannins are really um, great materials though for artists to use because they work differently than pigments. Most ink uses a pigment and a vehicle and a binder. You know, the ink that I held up before this one has got an artist grade pigment in it. It's got shellac as the binder a naturally occurring resin. And when you draw with it, the, uh, the water evaporates out of it and what gets left behind is the pigment in the binder. When you work with tea, with anything that has these natural compounds, these tannins in it, when you draw with it, it actually oxidizes. When it's exposed to the air, it changes color. It becomes darker and richer in color. And so I'm gonna show you how to do that. Um, so first things first, for any of you who have your, uh, your tea bags, um, all that you wanna do is take four or five tea bags, drop them into your container, and then add about 100 mils of water to it. So I'm gonna do that first. I'm gonna take my tea bags and then while our tea steeps, we're gonna to get to drawing. So I'm gonna take those. There we go. There's four and five. And when you put your water in, just make sure that the water covers those tea bags completely. So I'm gonna shove them down there into the bottom and I'm gonna add about 100 mils of water, just enough to soak the tea bags and cover them. I don't wanna to do too much because I don't wanna dilute it. That should be enough. And I've got a little stick here and I'm just gonna push them down and in. There we go. So I've got my tea now all steeping nicely in the bottom of my Pyrex. I'm gonna take that and I'm just gonna put it to the side. All right, so again, about 100 mils, 70 to 100 to 120 mils, however much it takes just to soak your tea bags. In fact, they've soaked up a bit for me now, so I'm gonna add a bit more. There we go. All right, I'm gonna set that aside and let's get to drawing. Okay. To begin with, what you need for your drawing is you need that, uh, that, that drawing by Boucher, and you have the link there in the chat, and it was also shared with you for the event. So grab that Boucher drawing and put it somewhere where you can see it. And let's switch the camera over here. All right, and hopefully everybody can see my sheet of paper. Now there too. Let me get my paper just clipped on. All right, there we go. And I'm gonna get the drawing set up for myself so I can see it. Okay, and what I'm gonna have you do first is take whatever material that you have to work with, whether that's pencil, pen, whatever it, ha whatever it is, and let's take about five to six minutes and just do a bit of a warm up and do a drawing based on that Boucher drawing, Venus with two cherubs. Uh, you'll see Venus reclining, classical kind of uh, reclining nude. Here, let me move it down so you can actually, there's the drawing right there that I have on my tablet. Um, and you all have the link to it as well. Um, you have Venus there reclining. You see that she's holding what looks like, uh, it looks a bit 
like a chicken to me, but uh, they are under her chin and on her shoulder. It's actually a dove. Doves are associated with Venus as symbols of love. And then you see the two cherubs, also symbols of divinity and love. Um, Venus, obviously a very, very popular uh, subject matter in European art history. Um, an easy way to get a uh, nude figure onto paper or canvas. Um, I've got a, I've, actually I'll share this with you. I've got a wonderful uh, set of books that was written by the Metropolitan and published by the Metropolitan Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York in the 1950s. And uh, there's one of the volumes of that set is dedicated to Venus and her popularity in, the, in Western art. Uh, and there's a wonderful quote in the book where the author uh, writes that part, one of the things that, uh, that contributed to her popularity were her frequent lapses from Olympian dignity, which I think might be uh, one of the most 1950s quotes I've ever heard. All right, so there she is. So we're going to use this um, as our model, as our guide, and we're going to draw from this drawing. So set that drawing, um, put it in a screen and a window off to the side there where you can see it really easily. Um, and then grab whatever material you might have, which is handy. I'm going to use a uh, charcoal pencil and I'm going to use charcoal rather than graphite because it's a little bit denser. It's a little bit blacker. And so it'll be easy for you to see. And let's just do a little bit of a warm up this morning. So let's take about, oh, let's say five or six minutes. I'll talk as you draw, but don't stop drawing just because I'm talking. All right. And let's dive right in and, uh, and do some drawing. So looking at that entire composition of the reclining Venus, with the dove and the two little cherubs and let's draw. All right, and I'll make sure that I'm in the frame there so you can see over to that side and over to that side as well. I'm gonna reach around the webcam here so hopefully you can, uh, you can see that quite clearly. All right, now as you're drawing, I just want you to be thinking about the overall layout um, where those figures are on the paper. Keep it quick, keep it loose. You can see the way I'm holding the charcoal pencil. Um, rather than holding it and dragging my palm across and working only with my fingers, I'm holding that pencil underneath my hand. You can see like that. That way it frees up my wrist and my arm to draw. You'll also see sometimes when I draw, I'll actually use an inverted hold where I'll actually hold with my palm up like that and laying the pencil. If I want to do a much lighter mark, I'll oftentimes work upside down and then switch right side up like that. So try to avoid holding that pencil like you're signing your name. So because if you do that, you'll be dragging your hand across your drawing constantly. All right. And again, we're, we're going to get into some bad habits and some bad drawing. But let's begin just with a nice freehand technique and laying out that figure overall. And if you don't get the whole thing done in about uh, five minutes or so, don't worry about it. It's no big deal, but let's draw. I also have a few people here in my studio. My daughter's here drawing with me and uh, my partner's here as well. And so they're gonna be doing a little bit draw of drawing with us this morning. All right, laying out Venus then. All right, now Boucher, let's talk a little bit about Boucher. Boucher associated with the Rococo movement. Um, we're talking a French uh, movement in the 18th century. Uh, Boucher was a favorite of Louis XV and uh, a favorite of the court of Louis XV, including uh, the Marquise Pompadour. And you might be aware of the very famous uh, portrait of her that uh, was painted by Boucher. But as a really interesting uh, character, because um, during his lifetime, he, as I said, cycled in and out of favor. And then in the 20th century really fell out of favor, being seen as a very, very decorative kind of an artist who was, uh, who was oftentimes criticized for the, the prettiness and, uh, and sort of uh, fluffiness of his scene. So, um, a, uh, a British art critic named Jonathan Jones, when uh, reviewing a, a Boucher exhibition just a couple of years ago, referred to his, uh, his paintings and drawings as flimsy and ethereal or ethereal and flimsy. I can't remember which, uh, which order he put them in, but that's very typical of the, of the critique of Boucher. But talking about badness, you know, when we talk about aesthetic badness, technical badness, moral badness, cultural badness, one of the great critiques of Boucher was that women liked his work. And so you can think about, uh, you can think about that in, the, in a contemporary context. Um, that was a criticism that was leveled against him by the great philosopher Denis Diderot, um, who very much reviled Boucher's work. All right, so how are we doing there? Is everybody, I know I'm talking instead of drawing, but everybody is laying out their drawing. 
getting a sense of the overall movement, where Venus is sitting in space. There's her hand as she holds this little chicken of desire on her shoulder. Okay, there we go. There is one wing out. And then you get the little cherubs. Venus always intended, always attended either by um, Eros, her son, or these little divine puti, they're called, P-U-T-T-I, little cherubs. Okay, there we go. Oh, and there's another one there. All right, I don't want to take too much time on this. Let's take another minute. How's everybody doing with their little sketch of, uh, of Venus at home? Uh, so occasionally, sorry, sometimes I'll ask rhetorical questions. Other times I'll ask questions that I want everybody to, uh, oh, somebody said done, nice. Um, feel free to just answer right there in the chat. And uh, my assistants, what's it say? <laughs> nice. Um, and we'll look at the chat. Sometimes I'll ask questions. I'll ask you all for some feedback too. So please don't hesitate to, uh, to type right there into the, into the chat window and we'll keep our eye on that as we go through. All right, there we go. There's a little shoulder up, a little pudgy arm coming down. There we go. All right. I always say with drawing, you know, part of it is being selective. Being selective, I always say the key to drawing is tension and attention. Every drawing has tension and you pay attention to certain things. You bring selective attention in your drawings. All right. Oh, uh, yeah, let's give a little bit of her drapery. There we go. And she's leaning on. Now I was saying about Boucher. Um, so Boucher became the first painter to the king, to Louis the XV. Um, again, uh, going back to the, uh, to the 18th century and this Rococo movement. Um, but then Boucher really fell out of favor um, with the realists in the 19th century and then through the 20th century and only recently now has cycled back in to favor again. Boucher, you know, you think about the realists of the 19th century. Boucher said he never painted from nature. He hated nature. In fact, the famous quote by Boucher was, nature is both too green and poorly lit. So, all right, now, um, okay, so you've done that quick drawing. Now, I would, I'd ask everybody to give me a little feedback before we move on to the, um, yeah, let's switch camera back. Uh, give me a little bit of feedback um, before we move on to uh, continuing with our tea-based ink. How'd that first drawing go? Does it look good? Does it look bad? What do you think? Uh, hard to do proportions, somebody says. Uh, <laughs> not for beginners, a little bit rough, bad. Okay, now here's what I'm going to ask. If you think the drawing went badly or went bad. I'm getting a lot of bad. <laughs> that's fantastic because that's our theme for today. I'm hoping everybody's doing bad drawing. What makes it bad? So somebody said um, proportion. And one of the reasons I like to do bad drawing workshops is because when you talk about bad drawing, it oftentimes will help you to identify, to articulate, but also to interrogate, to analyze what you think is good. What are your values and what are your, frankly, your biases in drawing? So if you look at the Boucher drawing again, the Boucher drawing is not in proportion. Her head is tiny compared to her body. And again, Boucher was not interested in working from life or from nature. He was interested in distorting the body according to his ideal of beauty, his ideal of, uh, of pleasure and sensitivity as well. And so when we talk about what makes a drawing good or what makes a drawing bad, I'm gonna ask you that question and then we're gonna take each one of your answers and really think about what it means and the implications of that. All right. <laughs> Some people are some people are upping the uh, the uh, people are going into particularly bad, horrible, dreadful, you know, um, <laughs> mortal. Okay, which is good. I want to talk a little bit more about that in just a minute. But let's uh, before we get back to the bad drawing, let's continue on for our bad ink because now everybody's tea has been steeping really well there in uh, and should be cool enough to handle. All right, so I'm gonna go on to the next phase of getting your tea ink ready to draw with now. And I'm gonna switch back over to the other camera so that you can see this quite closely. All right, so let's switch back over here and you should be able to see the tea. There it is. All right, um, nicely, uh, really, really dense. It would probably taste like hell, but there it is. And then I have another little container here. Okay, a little glass container. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take each one of those tea bags out and I'm just going to squeeze it. Make sure it's cool enough. Don't touch it, please, if it's still hot. But if it's cool enough, I'm going to take that tea bag out and I'm going to just, as you can see here, let me grab one. There it is. And I'm just going to squeeze the tea out gently. 
okay? So I want that nice, concentrated, rich tea, but I'm gonna do it gently so I don't break the tea bag, okay? And then that one's spent, and then I'm gonna grab the next one. All right, I'm just gonna work my way through each one, just squeezing out that really, really concentrated tea. There. And that's gonna be loaded with those tannins I was talking about before. There we are. It's gonna get a little bit messy. That's it. Squeeze that out. And last one. Okay, I did five tea bags. Now, different black teas will have different amounts, different types, um, qualities of tannins in them. I'm using a very cheap one here, cheap black tea. Um, if you use different black teas, um, you will actually get different colors and different qualities out of it. So squeezing all that, it looks like I wound up with about 25 mils of tea there left in my, uh, when I squeeze those out and I'm just gonna move that to the side and get rid of it. Now, what I'm not gonna be able to do now because we don't have time, but what I would do once I had that 25 mils of good tea concentrate, um, and you'll see this in the demo, uh, the recipe that I put online for y'all, um, what I would do with that now is I'd pour that into a little saucepan and I would just put it on the burner and I would cook off about half of the water from that. So I would concentrate it down by cooking it down even more. So I get a really, really dense, dense concentrated um, tea with all of those beautiful rich tannins in it. And I've actually done that. Um, I did that yesterday and actually made this little bottle right here. So this started off as about this amount right here, about 25 mils, and then I cooked it down to about 12 to 15 mils right there. Now, the other thing that you can do in preparing your tea, oftentimes you are preparing your ink, I should say, is you don't want it to be too watery. You want it to have a little bit of viscosity, a little bit of thickness. Now, typically you could add to it a material called gum arabic, which is the same binder which is used in watercolors. And if you have gum arabic, you could certainly add that to it. But in a pinch, you can just use any kind of starch. All right, so corn flour, corn starch works really, really beautifully. Um, but you can also uh, use this tapioca flour. So if you take that and you just take a pinch of that and put it in there, it'll add a little bit of thickness to it too. So the next stage I would do is I would cook that down and then I would add a little bit of, uh, of starch to it, but you don't even have to do that. You can use it just as is right now, and it'll make a really, really lovely, um, a lovely mark on your sheet of paper. Now, I mentioned to you earlier that, that uh, using a tannin-based ink, um, let's switch cameras again, is a very, very old uh, recipe for using, uh, for using, uh oh, am I glitching there for everybody? How, how am I looking? I hope it works well. Yeah, okay. Sorry, good, good, good. All right, thanks. Thanks, y'all. Okay. Um, yeah, a little bit of corn, as I said, a little bit of anything starch, any really fine starch. So a little bit of corn flour, a little bit of tapioca flour, anything like that will work to give it a little bit of thickness. It won't last forever. You can actually put preservatives in it. Um, there's, there's essential oils you can put in it that will help preserve it, but it won't last forever. You're better off just making it um, every week or two when you want to use it. Um, but one of the oldest inks that's used, that's been used in Europe and Australia and America, and in fact, some of our most famous documents were written in these types of inks, are what are called gall inks, iron gall inks, where you take a tannin-rich tannin -rich material like your tea, and then you mix something ferrous, iron, in with it. And the iron interacts with the tannins that are in there. And then when you draw with it, it actually oxidizes. And that's the thing about these tannin-based inks, like tea or iron galls, those are growths on, um, galls are growths on trees, usually oak trees, oak galls. And then when the tannins and the iron interact, it, there's a chemical reaction there. And then when it oxidizes on the piece of paper, it actually darkens and changes color. Um, so, you know, the, the American Declaration of Independence is written in an iron gall ink. So many famous documents are. Um, and I actually have one right here. We'll, sw we'll switch cameras again uh, so that you can see this. But what this little, it looks like a black ink. But actually what that is, is tea. All it is is a black tea. And then to that black tea, I've added iron powder, a ferrous powder you see right there. Um, and it's when the iron interacts with it, you make an, you make an iron 
tannin ink and iron gall ink. You can even use iron dietary supplements. So the kind of um, iron sulfite tablets you can buy at the chemist as a dietary supplement, you can crush up and put in with your tea-based ink. And I'll show it to you right now. I'll do a little bit of drawing with it. Here, let me shake it up. Give it a bit of a shake there. And I'll show you the kind of mark it makes. Drop my pen in. There. There we go. And I'll do it right here so everybody can see that. And you can see it's a beautiful sort of a gray line. And the wonderful thing about this, uh, this ink, this, this uh, iron-based uh, tannin ink, and this is just tea with a bit of iron in it, is as it oxidizes, as the air hits it, it'll darken and it'll change color, become a little bit warmer. And it's just a, just a, a wonderful bad ink to, to draw with. Okay, so if you have your tea, we are going to be doing a little bit of drawing with your tea um, coming up next. If you don't have tea and you wanna work with, uh, with just pencils or uh, other materials, that's fine too. You can use, um, now, you saw me drawing right there with a, uh, with a dip pen, with a steel nib, uh, like a, uh, a bit like a calligraphy pen. Um, but what I also wanna show you before we do the next drawing is making your own pen. Um, because if you're, gonna, if you're gonna draw with bad ink, you should also have a bad pen. And the easiest way to make your own pen is to make a reed pen, the same sort of pen that's been used for thousands of years by artists. And you can make out of any piece of bamboo and any piece of bamboo you have laying around the house will work. I've got one here which I made out of a bamboo chopstick and I carved. I've got one here, which is a bamboo garden stake. You can buy about a hundred of these garden stakes at your home improvement store for a couple of bucks and make all the pens you want all day long. I even have one here, I'll hold up, which I made out of a bamboo skewer um, made for barbecue. And again, bamboo, there, I just bought 120 of these bamboo skewers for $2.80. And uh, you could make 120 pens out of it. So I want to show you how to do a pen really quickly too. Um, and then, uh, yeah, coffee, somebody as people have been writing coffee and other things on there. Yes, coffee works well too. Coffee will not give you quite the, the quality, the sensitivity that tea will, but uh, it will work. So let me um, switch over to the other camera. And I want to show you how to make one of these pens really easily and really quickly, how to make a reed pen. We switch over to the other camera. Um, I'll hold that so you can see that is a reed pen, which I just carved myself. All right, right there. And I just carved this one yesterday um, as I was getting ready for this. So all that this is, is a bamboo garden stake, an ordinary piece of dried bamboo. And then the only other thing that you would need is just any kind of a craft knife or pocket knife. Okay, this one uses a carpet blade, but any type of a craft knife will work. And so let me show you really quickly. I've got a piece of bamboo here, which I will use for this. All right, so um, here's a bamboo garden stake right here. Um, and the wonderful thing about bamboo is, of course, it's, it's got this soft, you know, bit of hollow bit in the middle. And then all you're going to do in order to make your, uh, your bad pen to go along with your bad ink is just carve out that bamboo into a pen shape. Really, really easy to do. So using your knife, please cut away from you. All that you're going to do is just start whittling. Just start shaving away at that bamboo. And if your knife is sharp and the bamboo is, is a nice dry piece of bamboo, and again, you can do this with a chopstick, you can do it with a bamboo skewer, anything. You're just going to start carving it away there. You can see now I've already taken about half of it away. Nice smooth motions. It'll get easier as you cut through until you get down where the bamboo is fairly flat. Does everybody see, whoa, where are we? Does everybody see that there? So it's fairly flat. Once it's fairly flat like that, then you can begin shaping it. So now I'm carving both sides of the bamboo in order to taper it in like a pen point. Okay, again, cutting away from you. All right, like that. And again, these are all things you can do very easily at home. I'm just gonna keep cutting. All right, you can see there, now I've got a good taper starting to look like a pen right there. And I'm gonna just carve out a bit more to make it a little bit thinner a little bit finer, and there we go. All right, now you have a pen. All right, now the last step that you would wanna do with your pen, you'll notice that most pens, and here's a commercially made um, bamboo pen right here, um, they have a slit that runs up the middle. And that slit is to allow the, give it a little bit of flexibility and allow the ink 
to run down. And it's very easy to do. I probably won't be able to do this on my drawing board because my drawing board is uh, up at an angle. But what you would want to do next is just push your knife down, right, you know, come up about, ooh, I'd say half an inch, a quarter inch from the tip, push your knife down right into the center and just split that bamboo. And because of the structure of bamboo, it'll split really easily. So I'm gonna go off camera here for just a minute. I'm gonna set it down on my, uh, on my surface that I'm working on, that I'm sitting on, and I'm just gonna push the knife down and split it. All right, there it goes. And I just did it. And so we'll pop back to this other camera again, and I'll push on it so everybody can see that now that's split. Does everybody see that? There, yes, okay, perfect. And that's it, I am ready to draw. So I now have a homemade reed pen, ancient technology there. I can then take, I'll just, before I switch my sheet of paper, I'll show you. I can then take my tea-based ink and my reed pen and I'm ready to draw. All right, just like that make beautiful marks. And that tea, again, the wonderful thing about it, because it's got those tannins in it, is when it goes on, it'll seem lighter, but as it dries and as it oxidizes, it'll become darker. All right, so those of you who have tea, I'm gonna encourage you to do some, uh, some tea and pen uh, drawing for the next drawing we're going to do. But I also wanna point out one more thing about the Boucher drawing, and I'll move it down here. Um, the Boucher drawing, is done in a technique, um, a venerable old drawing technique um, called the three pencils or three crayons technique um, or trois crayons as it was called. And it's difficult to see here in the Boucher, but this type of uh, three crayons technique always used black and you'll be able to see there's a bit of black in there and you'll actually see it says red, black and white chalk. Um, there's a bit of black, then this red, which is called sanguine, um, this beautiful red orange color. It's it's named after the Latin word for blood because it was thought to look like dried blood. It's just a red ochre. Um, that sanguine color, and then it's heightened as it's called with white. So this has white chalk on top of this brown paper in order to heighten those highlights, to bring those highlights out too. And you can easily replicate that, uh, that three crayons, that trois crayons style um, with crayons that you might have lying around the house. If you're like me and you have kids and you do book lists every year, you've gotten a million of these twistable crayons. Um, I remember when crayons were just wax wrapped in paper. I'm not sure when all this plastic got involved, but if you have uh, just an ordinary crayon, so these are from my kids uh, spent book lists here. I have a kind of a reddish brown there, a sanguine color. I've got a black crayon and then I've got a white one as well. And so if you have ordinary crayons, you can mimic this, uh, this three crayon style and you can work just on brown paper. So again, we're going to bad materials for bad drawing and brown paper, brown craft paper will work as a beautiful uh, surface to work on here too. If you've got your tea-based ink, then you can work in your tea-based ink or if you just have pencil or pen or anything else, you can work on that. All right, so now before we get to your next drawing and geez, tick tock, we're gonna run out of time y'all. I want you to intentionally make a bad drawing. I want you to think about badness, all right? I want you to think, what am I going to do? Am I going to, how am I going to make this drawing a bad drawing? So for the person who said before that your drawing was out of proportions, um, out of proportion. This time I want you to think, okay, I'm really going to make it out of proportion. I'm going to exaggerate. I'm going to distort. I'm almost going to verge on caricature with this drawing. For those of you who felt like, oh, wait, it was too, that, um, that you couldn't get enough done. You know, I want you that you couldn't work slowly enough. Good. Then I want you to work really fast. The fastest you've ever worked before. If you can say the word line in the time it takes you to draw a line, you're going too slow. All right. If you did, if you think, okay, what's bad? Well, stick figures are bad great. Then I want you to draw this whole thing out of stick figures, you know. So in other words, I want you to now purposely exaggerate what you think is bad in your own drawing and make this a bad drawing very intentionally. All right. So when I'm, I'm going to go with the proportion thing, since that's what somebody said. Oftentimes, you know, I had a student recently who said um, that he thinks, uh, he thought that his drawings were bad when he was being careless and they were only good when he was being careful. And I thought, great be careless, make the most careless drawing you've ever made in your life then. So I want you all to take a moment and think, <laughs> I see the comments. I want you to think for a minute 
about what can I do to properly make this a bad drawing, a very intentionally bad drawing. I'm going to make mine way out of proportion with the, uh, with the Boucher drawing that uh, I'm using as the, as the model for it. But you decide on your own strategy, all right? And let's go into it together and, uh, and do a bad drawing, okay? All right. <laughs> these, are, these are great. Now, okay, I will say one thing. I always, you know, university students, I will invariably have a, a student who says there's no such thing as a bad drawing, you know, that it's a, and then I'll, I, I will invariably say to that student, does that mean you've never made a bad drawing? and the student will be like, okay, no, that's not true. Okay, so anyway, I want you to try to make a bad drawing as bad as you can. And then at the end, we are gonna ask you to share all of these drawings too. Michaela's gonna pop back on here with a few minutes to go and give you some, uh, some mechanisms that you can use to share your drawings with us. All right, we're gonna try to do a couple of bad drawings. We're gonna do this one first and we're gonna switch and we're gonna do another one. All right, so I'm gonna focus on proportion as my strategy. You focus on your own strategies and let's dive right in and do some bad drawing this morning. All right, I'm gonna get a fresh sheet of paper and I'm actually gonna work in the tea-based ink here so you can see what that looks like. And I'm gonna work with my homemade pen and my tea-based ink. All right, fresh sheet of paper. All right, let's take about five minutes on this drawing, y'all. Okay, Lati, you're gonna draw two, five minutes. You're gonna make a bad drawing, okay? All right, you've already made a bad drawing. Okay, I want you to make another one. All right, oh, see? No, okay. So my, my daughter is showing me her bad drawing, which is actually really, really good. That's a fail. You know, I want you to try to make a bad drawing. Okay, all right, let's go. All right, let's dive right in. <laughs> all right, let's do another one. Here we go. All right, go about five minutes on this. Again, my strategy here is going to be to use uh, bad proportions relative to the Boucher drawing. So um, she has already a tiny head. I'm going to make her head even tinier. All right. And I'd like you, if you can share with us in the comments, um, share with us what it is that you're doing as your bad drawing strategy and what you think is truly going to make it a bad drawing. And then the question is, ask yourself um, the inverse. So if you think it's a bad drawing because X, then think, okay, does that mean that the opposite would make it a good drawing? So if you think, okay, well, it's a bad drawing because I don't have enough control or enough skill, does that mean that having a lot of skill makes good drawings? Um, and that's a big debate in the 20th century when it comes to skilling and de-skilling, especially in modern and contemporary art. All right, so there we go. A little sketch of, uh, of her. Yeah, okay, good, 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 good. Okay, my, my, uh, my strategy is to make the head really, really small. Okay, and then what I'm going to do, there we go, I've got the Boucher head. You can see the way that tea-based ink um, is working there on the page. And again, just gives, um, unfortunately, because I know we're supposed to be doing bad drawings and that's a, the tea makes a really lovely mark. So I apologize, you guys are gonna have to overcome the, the, the nice quality of that tea in your drawings. All right, there we go. Now, as I said, Boucher has really, um, one of the interesting things about him is that he has cycled back into fashion and popularity over the last 30 years. Um, again, uh, Boucher was considered the epitome of French aristocratic and then uh, petite bourgeois taste um, and the thing to be avoided at all costs in the, in the latter half of the 19th and then through the, the, the early 20th century. But the focus on pleasure, on decadence, on a kind of exaggerated kitsch in his work is now something that uh, is being looked at uh, anew with, in, with really interesting, I think, uh, interesting exhibitions, uh, interesting books, interesting works being written about Boucher recently. All right. And I have to admit, um, this, this drawing was an exhibition at the Art Gallery of New South Wales some years ago, but I hadn't actually, didn't realize this drawing was in the, the Queensland Art Gallery collection and before I started to, uh, to do a search. All right, there we go. And so I'm gonna really exaggerate the arms. I'm gonna make her really quite a footballer here. There we go. I'm gonna exaggerate the back. Now, of course, the implication is that exaggeration and distortion um, 
would inherently make a drawing bad. But of course, you know, the, one of the keys for today is we know that that's not true, that intuition, exaggeration, distortion are all tremendous values in, in uh, art, contemporary art and art of the last 150 years. Uh, markers of idiosyncrasy. You know, we think about uh, Joy Hester's drawing and William Dobell's drawings and Sidney Nolan's drawing and Alice Neal's drawings and all of these drawings, which are actually incredible drawings, good drawings, and drawings which really defy um, traditional definitions of goodness in drawing. All right, there we go. There's my Boucher with a giant back, giant shoulders. How's everybody out there doing with your bad drawing? Tell me how it's going. It's gotten worse. Good. <laughs> <laughs> That's a win. All right. Okay. Now, I would like you, if you can, share in the chat because I'm gonna I'm gonna come over and have a look here, and I'm gonna do the the little cherub's head quite large now. Um, I'm gonna come over and have a look at the chat in just a minute. But I would like you to tell me what are your bad drawing strategies? What are you trying to do badly? And then how's it coming out? And I'll let the cat out of the bag here since we only have a few minutes left together. But I always do this exercise with my drawing students. And invariably, by the end of the term, after they've done an entire semester with me, I'll have students will come back and say the bad drawing they did on the first day of class was their favorite drawing they did of the entire term. All right. Okay. All right. Let's see. Okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read a few of your comments. Oh. Now, somebody wrote down that they managed to do a fat stick figure. I would love to see um, what that looks like. You've got to share that. <laughs> They're flying by too fast. All right. Uh, drawing so fast. Excellent. Excellent. I'm getting a lot of just oops. Um, face, um, face like a witch is, uh, <laughs> is, I'd love to see what that looks like too. You know, it's interesting, right? How do we define taste? One of our big issues, and one of the reasons I wanted to use tea this morning too, and tea that actually has a taste, and the more tannins it has in it, the more bitter it is. And how do you define something which is sweet, right? How do you define something which is in good taste? Um, one of the big criticisms of Boucher was that his work was too sweet. It was sticky sweet, syrupy sweet, and that he lacked taste. That was uh, one of Diderot's great criticisms of him. Um, and that Diderot also said that anybody who liked his work must also also lack taste. And so when we talk about bad drawing, when we talk about good drawing, or we talk about drawings which are good, then become bad, then become good again, the way they might cycle in and out, we might be talking about taste. And we might be talking about uh, how taste changes. And for you as artists drawing at home and working through the drawing, you're dealing with your own taste and your own bias. You know, there are works, there are many, many artists who work in what could be talked about as a kind of glorified stick figure. And they're wonderful drawings, they're beautiful drawings, they're drawings which are abstract and exaggerated and distorted, and they're chaotic and they're unfocused, they're irrational. And those are all markers of goodness nowadays. So what I hope we get out of this bad drawing workshop is you thinking about how you define good drawing and bad drawing, and then how you really analyze that in your own drawings. Okay, so I'm looking at the comments now. All right, um, bad hair. <laughs> Venus is having a bad hair day for somebody. Bad drawing is freedom. Okay, I, I see that comment and uh, I wish I was wearing a t-shirt that said that uh, right now because that is our, uh, our mode for today. Okay, now, all right, let's, let's stop. Uh, let's, let's pause there with your first bad drawing and we're gonna go over, we only have time to do one more drawing. This is how it always, how it always goes. You are gonna share your drawings and show your drawings. We're gonna have a whole Boucher bad drawing party online. Um, Michaela's gonna come on at the end and she's actually gonna tell you how to share your drawings with us because I, I really, really wanna see your drawings. All right, we're gonna switch over. We're gonna do one last bad drawing. I want everybody to think again um, about making a bad drawing strategy. So think again, okay, I, you just did something in that last one, think what am I gonna do? And I want you to think about what's, what can make it bad other than just the aesthetic, right? So you might think, oh, well, it looks bad. A lot of students will oftentimes say, oh, it doesn't look like the thing that I'm drawing and that's what makes it bad. But resemblance 
doesn't necessarily equal goodness, right? Um, you can talk about moral badness. You can talk about bad taste. You know, one of the other criticisms of Boucher was that it was just downright sleazy, you know? So when you think about badness, um, there's a lot of different ways that you can take badness and your interpretation of badness. So we're gonna do one final big bad draw on y'all. All right, so I want you to get one final sheet of paper. I'm gonna switch it over now. I'm gonna switch it over to um, a sheet of brown paper. And uh, so I can do a little bit of that trois crayon technique. Um, and I'm gonna work with children's crayons on this uh, brown sheet of paper. All right, so let's get yourselves set up. One more sheet of paper. And we've got about five minutes left. We can do uh, one more drawing. All right, let's dive right in. Okay, let's switch that camera again. All right, and I'm gonna move away my, my Venus footballer. And take a sheet of, this is just ordinary. This is just a, a postal wrap paper. It's really, really low quality craft paper. Okay. Strong paper, that's what craft means. There we go. So let me put my strong paper down. How's that? Oh, I need to move it over a bit. I'm not in frame. There we go. There we go. There's my brown paper. I'm not going to be able to clip that one onto the edge of my board, but that's all right. There we go. Okay, and now I'm going to do this drawing on bad paper with bad materials to make a bad drawing. And we'll see if bad materials uh, equate to a bad drawing. So I'm going to be using my children's twisty crayons straight from the, uh, the second grade book list right here and see what I come up with. All right, let's go. Yeah, let's go uh, five minutes on this drawing. And please share with me in the chat what your bad drawing strategies are. All right, let's go for it. All right, I'm going to start with this sort of red ochre color again, um, known as sanguine. That's uh, S-A-N-G-U-I-N-E, if you're looking it up. And you'll be able to find, if you ever go to an art supply store, you'll see they'll, they'll charge you loads for, for crayons that uh, say sanguine on them, especially Conte crayons and things like that. All right, there we go. And again, you see I'm using a good freehand technique here. Um, crayon, just really quickly, the term crayon in drawing. Crayon is any sort of material which has a waxy or greasy base. It doesn't necessarily mean children's wax crayons. So, um, you know, oil pastels and things like that are technically types of crayons because they use a, a, a greasy base. And oftentimes they do have wax in them as well, depending on the quality of them. So a crayon is anything that uses a, a greasy or waxy base, as opposed to a friable material like graphite or charcoal or a liquid material like watercolor or ink. All right, so I'm gonna go really put that uh, dove's head in there again. There we go, really exaggerate that bird's head and wing. Against Venus's muscular arm. All right. And this takes us right there. All right. Okay, how's everybody's bad drawings going? <laughs> the word here in, the, in my studio is that they're going badly. That's great. All right. I'm looking badly. Good. Excellent. All right. Please keep up the badness. And I would say to you, because I'm going to run out of time, do this bad drawing as, a, as an exercise. Do it as a warm up. You know, let yourself get out of your own habits and your own, um, as I said before, just your own mindset, your own biases of what might make a drawing good or bad for you. And by forcing yourself, telling yourself, I'm intentionally going to do a bad drawing, you're absolutely right that it'll free up the way that you're thinking about your own drawing and the way that you're able to explore methods of drawing, which you wouldn't be confident doing if you're so concerned that the drawing won't come out good. All right. All right. So let's keep going with everybody. Oh, tick tock. Um, somebody's pointing at their watch. All right. Um, just really quickly, if I was working this trois crayon technique, I would use a white crayon at the end to come back and to heighten again. And typically this was done in, in white chalk, or it could have been done in a material called gouache or body color, which is an opaque watercolor. But if I was going to do that, I would bring the black and that sanguine color and the white heightening there at the end. Okay. Tick tock. Let me flip back to the other camera. This always happens to me, y'all, that uh, 
I run out of time. <laughs> I talk too much. Oh, somebody said that they went all hairless um, uh, figures. That's fantastic. Long neck. Excellent. Um, long, skinny, not looking at the paper while you draw. Great strategy. Blind drawing. Some people will use their non-dominant hand to do this. Left-handed. Somebody else put part blind drawing. Fantastic. I want to see all of these. These are great methods, tried and true methods. And all of those methods, some of you might have used before, blind contour drawing, drawing with your non-dominant hand. Those are techniques, de-skilling techniques that's really emerged in the 20th century as a method for getting people warmed up and getting outside of their own taste bubbles when it comes to drawing. Now, oh, taste bubbles. <laughs> <laughs> be a great name for a band. All right. So look, we only have five minutes left. I know Michaela wants to come back in and uh, chat with us about the rest of the series. Look, I'm going to be here every Saturday morning in June. Next week, Saturday, we're going to be doing body extensions. We're going to get out of the idea of control and dexterity with drawing, and we're going to uh, activate your entire body in the process of drawing in a, a workshop we're calling Extend Yourself. I'm then going to continue on with the last two uh, Saturdays in June. We're going to do mirror drawing. Drawing. We're going to talk about portraiture, um, and then we're going to get into doing some motion drawing again. Just a great workshop. Um, the final one we'll do on motion drawing, which is great to do um, with friends and family as well. So at that, I'm afraid I'm going to have to sign off. I, I can't wait to see all of your bad drawings. Thank you so much for joining me here this morning, y'all. It's been fantastic.